Well, good evening, everyone. Very glad to see everyone. I'm always thankful for the opportunities that I have. Uh, my family is going on vacation. I'm leaving at 5 in the morning with my parents and my two brothers and my sister. And uh, hoping I'll have a good time. Because <laughs> getting ready for this vacation was stressful. <laughs> I think sometimes that's how it is. <laughs> you try to get everything ready. That's so stressful, you know. It might have been better if we just stayed home. <laughs> we would have avoided a whole lot of stress. But, uh, yeah, we'll be leaving. We'll be gone for a week or so. And, uh, you know, Lord willing, we will be back. And uh, seems like Jeff and I coordinated. He, get, he gets back into town and I leave. <laughs> but uh, sometimes that's how it happens. Yeah, throughout my life, I've always tried to be the best evangelist I could be, trying to spread the word of God. And, and for the longest time, I, I, w- I wasn't a preacher and that was never my intention. I just always wanted to be a Christian that spread the word of God. And what happened is it kind of you know, naturally manifested myself into uh, subbing in and preaching various places. But my main motivation was I just wanted to spread the word of God. And certainly throughout my life, I know that I've, only, I've not always done the best job at spreading the word of God. I know I've made many mistakes and many shortcomings. I think that holds many people back from spreading the words of God because they're afraid that they'll make mistakes. But I think the reality that we have to accept is really there's only two options that we get boiled down to is people will either receive the words of God or they will reject the words of God. And we have to be very persistent that we never shut ourselves out of opportunities where we can spread the words of God. But what happens, I think, in our society and in our PC culture and our politically correct culture is what we've done is we've decided to take the options what the Bible has presented to us and we've decided to modify them, alter them, and make third and fourth options and trying to make everyone feel like they're okay. You're okay, I'm okay, everyone's okay. And what happens is, is really I think that's Satan's most powerful tool today, is making everyone think that they're okay in the situation that they find themselves. See, our society doesn't like the idea of two options, heaven and hell. Society doesn't like that option. You know something else our society doesn't like? It doesn't like the options of saved and lost. Our society doesn't like those options. And the options that we're going to look at this evening is receive and reject. At the end of time, that's what really it's going to boil down to. Have you received and accepted the words of God, or have you rejected them? In Acts chapter 13, if you'll turn there, we're actually going to find two groups of individuals. One group of individuals that receive the words of God, and another group of individuals that reject the words of God. In Acts chapter 13, starting in verse 45, going to 47, we start to see the group that is going to reject the words of God. It says, But when the Jews saw the multitude, they were filled with envy. And contradicting and blaspheming, they opposed the things spoken by Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles." Who rejected the words of God in this case? It was the Jews. And when we look at the Jews, and we think of the Jews as God's people, particularly the people of the Old Testament, here the prophecies are being fulfilled in relation to Jesus Christ. They're hearing the words of God in relation to Jesus Christ and Him being the Messiah that they have been waiting for. And what do they do? They reject the words of God. As many discussions I've had with individuals, what I find is when those discussions go south is when the listening stops. You know, when people decide they don't want to hear any more about the words of God is usually when those discussions uh, come to an abrupt halt, an abrupt end. And what happens is other motives of communication uh, come about. And many times in the book of Acts, we see that mode of communication stops the listening, stops the hearing, and what it turns to violence. We see uh, people turn to stoning. We see people turn to verbal attacks. And we see even mobs swarm against the apostles. It's so unfortunate that when we're trying to spread the words of God, that many people, for whatever reason, will decide they don't want to hear the words of God any longer. And what happens is the listening stops. And what happens when the listening stops is that faith cannot be obtained. If we think of what it says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, it says, So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If we're not hearing the words of God, certainly faith cannot be obtained. And whenever we're talking about uh, rejecting or receiving the words of God, when listening stops, certainly the word of God cannot get through to individuals. Well, what do we want to hear? We want to hear the gospel. That's what we want to get the message out about, the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12, it says, To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministered the things which 
uh, have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things which angels desire to look into. When we're talking about the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, people have waited a long, long time for this. The fulfillment of, of the prophecies, the Messiah coming, and when the, the message comes, everything's been fulfilled, the words of God goes out, sometimes it's received by rejection. That's what the Jews did here in this case. It's so easy when we have religious discussions with individuals that, that we see, and probably all of us have went through this process if we tried to spread the words of God, is that once people have decided they're going to reject the words of God or, or they're going through the process where they're struggling whether they're going to receive or reject the words of God, it's very easy for these conversations to get heated. It's very easy for these conversations to get emotional in these religious conversations when it comes to the words of God. And you know what? Times haven't changed that much. What do we see here as the Jews rejects the words of God is that as we see and the text goes on in verse 50, it says, But the Jews stirred up the devout and provident women and the chief men of the city raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas. Things really haven't changed. As many times when people reject the words of God and they have stopped listening to the words of God, what happens is people start to get heated. People start to get emotional. And what happens is... Once the listening stops, the word of God cannot be spread. We see the same pattern over and over again. Is once the listening stops, there is no progress that is made. I think of Acts chapter 17, just a few chapters later. We see uh, preaching of Christ in Thessalonica. And we see these individuals that are preached to... And, and Paul, as his custom, he went in on the Sabbath and he was reasoning with them about the scriptures and about Christ and how he suffered and how he raised again from the dead, as it says in verse 3. And then as we work down in verse 5, it says, But the Jews were not persuaded, becoming envious, uh, envious. They took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathered a mob, set all the city in uproar, and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring him out to the people. When the rejection happens, when people close their minds to the words of God, there's no progress to be made. See, rejection happens when people aren't listening anymore. Certainly this is a quality that Christians should have, and it's one that I've tried to maintain throughout my life as I've tried to have religious discussions. I think Paul was open to discussions. I think Paul was open to debate. In fact, when we look at him trying to spread the gospel, these were things that he constantly was involved in. Discussions, debate about who Christ was, what he went through, what he, uh, that he died and that he rose again. I try to remember the words that are said in James chapter 1 and verse 19. It says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. See, a lot of times the same things that we try to tell individuals to do are the same things that we are not willing to do ourselves. We say, why don't you listen to what I'm trying to tell you about the gospel? Why don't, why don't you sit down and don't get angry with me? And why don't you please sit down and listen to me? And, and consider your words before you speak. That's what we would want individuals to do when we are talking to them. But the question is, do we do that ourselves? See, I've always tried to be honest in religious discussions. When I sit down with individuals and I try to discuss the Bible with them, I try to give them time to explain their point of view, to discuss their points, to discuss their concerns, to discuss where they believe the Bible is saying a certain idea. Are we willing to listen when we enter these religious discussions? Are we so quick that we know the answer and that we will close all the other doors? And what we do is we close the chance for ourselves. I've always tried to be honest when I try to listen to other people's points in religious discussion. I try to do what it says in James chapter 1 and verse 19. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. I try to remember what it says in Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 1 where it says... Uh, uh, when it talks about a, a harsh word can stir up anger, but a soft response can kind of uh, dampen those uh, anger sometimes. But when people reject the words of God and they reject Christ, it's not a good solution. It's spiritual suicide. Because when we're talking about our spiritual lives, we're talking about heaven and hell, we're talking about eternity, we're talking about salvation, it's spiritual suicide to reject Jesus and to direct, uh, reject the words of God. But that's what people do. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 it says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. When we reject the words of God, when we reject Jesus, when we stop listening to the words of God, we are committing spiritual suicide. Because we just won't listen. Because we won't consider. Because those around us won't consider. 
I think the Jews fell into that trap. Of course the Jews believed that there was a God, but they weren't necessarily willing to listen to all the evidences in relation to Jesus Christ being the Messiah. And because of that, they rejected Jesus. But see, what our society tries to do is they try to paint a third category. See, you can reject God or you can receive God. But what people try to do, they try to say there's this middle category. Somehow there's this middle category where everything works out, everything's okay. And it's okay if you rejected God. Well, it's not, we don't want to call it that. It'll be okay, you'll be okay. Aren't there really just those two categories? You either reject the words of God or you receive the words of God. There's heaven and there's hell. There's lost and there's saved. But people don't want to discuss those categories. People don't want to have a realistic picture of their spiritual life. Because having a realistic uh, picture of their spiritual life would mean that they would have to ask some tough questions. That they might have to listen to the words of God. That they might have to consider the words of God. Certainly God has given us the truth in relation to salvation. He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, as it says in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. But what I fear is that when we try to spread the gospel and people reject the gospel over and over again, is what happens is we get afraid. And we say, well, people are going to reject the gospel anyways. I'm not going to go. I'm not going to spread the gospel. Because people are going to handle me so harshly as I try to spread the words of God, I'm not going to spread them anymore. Maybe we should take a few words from Paul in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 16. What Paul says in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 16, I try to remember constantly. In Galatians chapter 4 and verse 16, it says, Have I then become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Now here Paul's asking a question, but I wonder if we can honestly say that sometimes to our friends, to our families, to our loved ones, to those that are around us. Have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Are we willing to tell people the truth that are around us? Or or has our politically correct culture got us away from talking about heaven and hell? Has our politically correct culture got us away from talking about lost and saved? Has our politically correct culture got us away from talking about the idea that you will reject the gospel or you will receive the gospel? We can't paint a third category into this. Even if we want it, even if we desire it, it's not the truth. Have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? In 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 16, it says, For I, for if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. I wonder if we feel the same way that Paul does about the words of God. Woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. Necessity is laid upon me to spread the gospel, despite all the uh, rejection that's going to take place to the words of God. The Bible talks about all kinds of rejection of the words of God. In John chapter 12, verses 48 and 49, Jesus talks about people rejecting his words. If you reject Jesus' words, you're rejecting Christ. And people try to separate it. Well, I can follow Christ, but I don't really have to worry about his words so much. His words and Christ are connected. How could you ever separate the two? But people try to do that. People try to do that in the denominational world. I want Christ, but I don't want the words of Christ. In John chapter 12, verses 48 and 49. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The words that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command what I should say and what I should speak. If you reject the words of God, you reject the things that are going to be judging you on judgment day. And many people will make that decision. I will reject the words of God, and on judgment day they'll find out that those are the words that are going to be judging them. In 2 John chapter 1 and verse 9, it says, Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. Well, what's doctrine? Doctrine is teaching. You cannot separate Christ from his words. You cannot separate Christ from his teachings. And yet, that's what people try to do in this society. They try to eliminate things that God talks about. They try to add things that he didn't talk about. 2 John chapter 1 and verse 9, Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ, the teachings of Christ... Well, what about those people? They don't have God. I think some people are surprised when they read across those things, but we shouldn't be. It makes total sense. How could you reject the teachings of God and still say you're on God's side? It says, he who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. You know, if there's anything to trust in, it would be the words of God. If there's anything to trust in, it's the gospel that has been laid before us. But each individual will make their own decision. Will you cling to the words of God or will you reject the words of God? Because in reality, that's what it boils down to, whether we will reject or we will receive the words of God in our lives. And many people are going to be confused when it comes to Judgment Day because they don't, they're not going to have a clue what God has said. 
And they're going to say, I wanted God my whole life. I wanted Jesus my whole life. But they never took the time to look at Jesus' words. And then all of a sudden when judgment comes, they're in a confused state because they don't even know what God says. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. These people will say, God, weren't we doing all the things you wanted us to do? He said, you didn't consult my words. You rejected them. By laying your Bible aside, by not investigating, by not looking, by not listening, what you've done is you've rejected Christ. Are you going to reject the words of eternal life? Are you going to reject the words of our Savior? Those are words that I do not want to reject. In uh, John chapter 6, verses 66 through 68, it says, From the time many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more, then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Are you going to reject the words of eternal life? See, people are going to reject God for all kinds of reasons. Perhaps they're going to reject God because you know, God just doesn't fit into their life. Perhaps some people are going to not, uh, uh, people are going to reject God because they will not acknowledge their mistakes and their sin in their lives. Perhaps people will reject God because they say there's questions that God didn't answer, but certainly answered all of those. Maybe people will reject God because of their personal morality. They don't like the morality of the Bible. They don't like what God has to say about marriage, divorce, remarriage. They don't like what God has to say about our sexual relationships. They don't like what the Bible has to say about our conduct towards our neighbor. They don't like what the Bible has to say about the Christian worker. So you know what? Since I don't like those things, I'll reject it. Some people reject the Bible just simply because they don't believe it. Will we listen to the Holy Scriptures? Will we listen to the words of God? Will, they, will we let them lead us? Will we receive the words of God? Or will we just simply reject them? The first group we see here in Acts chapter 13 is the Jews. And they just flat out reject the words of God. The second group we find as we continue through the passage. In chapter 13, the Jews have rejected it. And they turn and they start speaking to perhaps another group of individuals. In verse 48 it says, Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. These people receive the words of God. Will we receive the words of God? See, when the gospel goes out, people are going to accept it or they're going to receive it. And I think many times we are just taken back many times as Christians as we try to spread the gospel. We're so concerned with the rejection that we never think of the possibility that someone could receive it. These, these, these apostles, as they go and spread the gospel... They are not trying to walk along the road and select the people that they think are going to be Christians. They don't walk up to people in their lives and say, you know what, you know, John, he's living a good life, he's a good guy, you know, he's already got a lot of Christian values that he's living by, he's a sincere guy, he's, a, he's doing a lot of good things. You know what, I think he's going to be a Christian, so I'm going to take the gospel to him. But we don't see the apostles doing this, this selection of picking the people that they think are going to receive the words of God. The gospel goes to everyone. And when the gospel goes out to everyone, you know what happens? Some people reject it and some people receive it. But I fear that sometimes, because we're so afraid of rejection, that the gospel doesn't even get to go out to many individuals. We see that the Gentiles, when they hear the gospel, the same gospel, the same words, probably presented in, in, in approximately the same way, it's the same message, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, they receive it. It's the same message. What changed? The people changed in their perception. They wanted to receive the words. I think that another good example is in Acts chapter 17. We have the people reject it in early, uh, the early part of the chapter in Thessalonica. The people reject the words of God. And then what happens when they get to Berea? Verses 10 and 11 in Acts chapter 17, it says that when the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. They did the same thing that they did in Acts chapter 13. They're going and spreading the gospel. It says these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, and they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. It's not like these individuals are just accepting anything they hear. They search 
They search the scriptures to make sure that what they're being that what they're being told is true. But it's the same message. It's the same message. What changed? Nothing changed. It was the individuals. When the gospel was first preached to the Jews, because that's what God wanted to happen, in Acts chapter 2, I have reason to believe that those 3,000 or so souls that were added to the church in Acts chapter 2 were mainly Jews. My reasoning for that is when we get to Acts chapter 11, this is where they're first called Christians, and the reason I think that is because I think there were some Gentiles in their midst. In Acts chapter 11 and verse 26, it says, And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. I mean, I'm not sure on that, but I think in Acts chapter 2, probably most of the crowd was Jews, and then once we get to Acts chapter 11, we're getting what God really wanted, a blend of Jews and Gentiles, the message going out to all individuals. The picture that we see in Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 28, it says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. All are one in Christ Jesus. Will we take the message to all individuals? Or will we select the people that we think are going to become Christians? Are we going to select the people that we think are going to receive the message? Are we going to take the message to all? In Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35, it says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The gospel goes to all. It's not my job to determine who's going to reject it and who's going to receive it. The job of the Christian, the job of the preacher, the job of the evangelist, the job of the Christian is to spread the message. And we know that when the message goes out, it will be rejected by many and received by many. We try to make all these divisions, I fear, when we try to spread the gospel. We have all these hidden rules, I think, sometimes we keep in our heads. Well, this individual, they're just living such a rough lifestyle, I don't think they would even give the time to listen to me. Or we look at this individual and say, well, they're such a great individual, I should probably spend most of my time with them. And we just don't do what the Bible says, take the gospel to all. Some people are going to reject the words of God, some people are going to receive the words of God, but send the words of God out every opportunity you have. In Luke chapter 11, verse 28, it says, But he said, More than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Are people hearing the words of God anymore? It said, Blessed are those who hear the words of God and keep it. Are people hearing the words of God in their homes? Are people hearing the words of God in the schools? Are people hearing the words of God in the communities? Or we as Christians just got so caught up in rejection, got so caught up in the PC culture of our society that the gospel isn't spread any longer. In James chapter 1 and verse 22, it says, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Be doers of the word, not hearers only. When we look at the, the situation in Acts chapter 13, we see a group of individuals that rejects the word of God. Then we continue on through chapter 13, and we see that the Gentiles hear it, and they gladly receive the words of God. But the last thing that I would like to point out is once someone has rejected or received the words of God, whenever this point is in their life, there is a continued response. And many times the continued response of rejection, I think, is what people are held back from when they try to spread the words of God, is they are not quite ready for the continued response of rejection. Because the continued response of rejection continues on for a long time. See, Paul rejects the Bible for a period of time. He rejects the words of God. He rejects Jesus as the Messiah. And he tells us what his continued response was when he rejected Christ. When he rejected Christ, he tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 9 what his continued response of rejection was. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 9 it says, For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. When Paul rejected the words of God, what was his continuation of response? He persecuted the church. Are you ready for that? Because that's what happens sometimes. When you try to spread the gospel, we expect a different response than the apostles. We expect a different response than Jesus. When we go out into the world and we try to spread the beautiful message of the gospel, we act like no one's ever going to reject it. Or we fear that people are going to reject it so much that we never take the gospel to them. 
But sometimes when people reject the gospel, they will reject it and their response will be directed towards you. When Paul rejects Christ, what does he go after? He goes after the church of God. He goes after the people of God because he's rejected the words of God. Sometimes the rejection is pointed directly at us. In John chapter 15, verses 18 through 21, God tries to warn us about this. It says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, but I have chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I have said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. I fear that in the United States, we've got so used to some of the valuable freedoms that we have. Some of the valuable freedoms that are not in other countries and other places of the world, I think that so many times we take them for granted. Some of our brothers and sisters in Christ, if they try to spread the gospel, they are under immediate physical, political, cultural persecution. For a long time in India, as soon as you got baptized... You were ejected from the family, ejected from all political status, and, and all your life is just taken away just from get, getting dunked in water. Of course, we understand the significance of doing what God has said in relation to baptism and being submerged in water after we confessed and done the appropriate things, obeying the gospel. We understand the implications. So does the government in India. They understand the implications that these people are saying, we're changing our lives, we're receiving the words of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12, it says, Yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ will suffer persecution. See, there's a continued response when people reject Christ. And a lot of times it's taken out on Christians. A lot of times it's taken out on those that have accepted and received the words of God. And we have to understand that and move forward, understanding that the gospel has to be spread. But the more beautiful picture is when we consider the person that responds to the gospel, receives the words of God, and we see their response. I think one of those great pictures we can find in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, we find the, the eunuch with Philip. And in Acts chapter 8, verses 35 through 39, we see the response of an individual who receives the words of God. And starting in verse 35, it says, Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning at, that script, at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. He preached Jesus to him. In verse 36, it says, Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. And then when he came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Peter away, so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. We see someone who receives the words of God. And we see that that has a continued response of joy, a continued response of trying to live the Christian life and doing the things that God would want us to do throughout our lives. But it's funny how many times in our society, in our PC culture, we try to blur the line. We try to pretend there's third options. We try to pretend there's fourth options. We try to pretend like everyone's okay, when in reality you fall in one of two camps. You have either received the words of God or you've rejected the words of God. That's the two camps you can fall into. What other camp can you fall into? What other camp can you be added to? What other camp can we put you in? And yet when we go out and spread the gospel, I fear that sometimes people try to make third groups. And when we make that third group, I think what happens is it decreases our eagerness and our wanting to spread the gospel. Because we're like, they'll be okay. There's a third option out there. There is no third option. Brothers and sisters in Christ, is there a third option? Is there another option? Is there another hope besides Jesus Christ? And I fear that many times when it comes to us trying to spread the words of God in the back of our head somewhere, we try to say there's a third option for some people out there. Somehow, some way, God's going to provide a third option. There is not salvation in any other but Jesus Christ. You either receive his words or reject his words. If you need to become a New Testament Christian, if you need to receive the words of God and obey Him and do those things that He said that we need to hear the words of God, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, if you need the prayers of the church, if you need our help in any way, we would love to help you any way we can. If you need to become a New Testament Christian or we can help you any way, please come as we stand and as we sing.